what am I doing here? So uh, the person whose who's thunder was stolen by, by the, the quick survey of who's here for R and who's here for the Duke, that was me, because uh, I was curious. Uh, see, I, I came to this from the R side, and uh, um, as I've gotten more into the, into the Hadoop space, thanks to the R Hadoop project, um, it, it's interesting the, the different connections of the different people we, we see each other. In fact, um, uh, I was looking forward to meeting a lot of people who are here today. I've had that opportunity, and I hope to get that opportunity to meet more of you um, at, at, after the talk. But one of the people was, was Ethan McCollum, who wrote all the Hadoop chapters for the Parallel R book. But uh, turns out he's in Boston, where I usually am, giving an R Hadoop talk to the Boston user group that I usually give talks to. So. Um, uh, but again, who, who am I? So I'm the president and co-founder of Atmosphere Research Group. We're a market research um, uh, firm uh, specializing in, in travel travel technology. I'm sort of the IT propeller head, big data geek in, in the crowd. Um, and I play with the big data for our clients and, and for the, the industry data. Um, but I also focus on big data as a, as a research topic. The, the link that's up here, the short URL, that goes to my GitHub where all of the code that you will see tonight, yes, caution, not a lot of code, um, all the code will be. And uh, part of this talk was, was uh, part of a, a larger uh, workshop that we did in Boston in March. This sort of covered uh, a whole range of big data topics from, um, hey, how do you run, you know, uh, uh, Cloudera on your laptop, all the way up to how do you do something interesting with it, with R, um, in the cloud with a bunch of nodes being spun up you know, fairly automatically with the work. Um, so all that code is on there too. You can poke around and look at the work and good files and, and, and we'll get there. Um, this is a rough outline of what we want to talk about. You know, why map reviews, why R, why are half of us here and half of us uh, uh, here for other reasons. Um, go over ways to use R and to do together because there are there are some other uh, approaches out there. Um, and then do a deep dive into R to do which is what, what I'm, I, I do is, uh, when I'm doing R and, and to do stuff, and we'll sort of get into why that is. Um, walk through the, the example step by step. This is the code part. And give you a hint as to some of the, some of the more advanced stuff you can do with R. So, sound good? Make sense so far? Excellent. Um, for those of you who don't know what MapReduce is, so MapReduce is a programming pattern um, that aids in the parallel analysis of Okay. It wasn't invented by Google, but certainly popularized by Google. Um, named for the two primary steps of a mapping phase, when you sort of pick out the pieces of the data that's interesting from a structured or unstructured uh, corpus of data. And then the reduced phase, when you are you know, doing something to that data to either get you the final answer or to, you know, as part of a processing pipeline on the way uh, to, to get something interesting. So for those of you who sort of in the R space, who, who, who are into the, the hadley Wickham school of, of, of functions like, like I am, especially the flyer of uh, hadley Wickham is a statistics professor at, at Rice University, and he has a very nice uh, way to explain these sort of, um, uh, 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 this sort of analysis uh, pattern that's split, apply, and combine. If you have too much data to deal with, you split it up in some meaningful way, you apply some function or some analysis to it, and then you combine all the results together. Um, in SQL, it could be as simple as using a group by to get stuff together, and then running out of new functions on it. Um, and there are other ways in base R using all of the various apply functions. Uh, uh, Flyer is just a, 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 a package that, that I use. And what's really sort of key about MapReduce, from, from my perspective, is as the analyst, as the data scientist, as the statistician, as the guy working with the data trying to get an answer, whatever you call yourself, it's up to you. You have the freedom and the responsibility to define what is interesting about that data at the time of analysis. You don't have to, so I come from IT, okay? You don't have to have eight <coughs> meetings with your database administrator or you know, to design a data warehouse to figure out just what the right schema is or you know, what's going to be the snowflake pattern, what not going to be. Just you know, copy it all over, figure it out at the time, and if you change your mind, next time you do analysis, some other bits of data are, are, are interesting, who are you just changing your mapper? Um, so, so why R? Well, R is an open source in, in R. It's, uh, it's, it's wildly popular. It's not new, and, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, 
really the key to R for me is how active and, and, and generous the community is. Um, in fact, part of the challenge I had in learning R was that there is sort of too much being contributed by the community. And I have a slide that shows how many packages are, are being contributed uh, each year. But um, what was key to understand is people who are the leaders in their field, uh, from, from you know, pure statistics to uh, bioinformatics to finance, um, leaders in their field are using R every day and contribute their code to, to the greater community um, for reuse. And there's some great visualization stuff out there, uh, which I'm particularly keen on. Um, and as we mentioned, there is commercial support available. Revolution Analytics does a good job offering a supported version of R that's it's an extension, it has, it has some proprietary extensions to, to open source R, um, but it's still compatible with it, and they offer training and support and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but before we go on, I have, I have a couple of confessions to make. And, and, and these are confessions to, to the R folks and to the, to the Hadoop folks. So first, for the Hadoop folks, um, boy was I wrong about MapReduce. So when the Google paper came out and it was sort of get really interested in MapReduce, 2004, I was running a typical enterprise IT department. So I think typical enterprise IT, you've got big hardware, expensive stuff, the best sun servers you can imagine, you have EAP EMC symmetrics, holding all our data, in fact, we had two of them. Um, we had big applications, you know, commercial applications, Siebel, PeopleSoft, we had uh, something from Vignette running all content management, you know, real enterprise, manly IT, as my business partner likes to call it. Um, big is Oracle SQL Server, and you know, you, you can name it. That also adds up to big licensing and maintenance support bills, 20% of the purchase cost every year. You get to pay and you can support it in the commercial software space. So some things about MapReduce and the way Google did things in particular was, it, was very attractive to me. Commodity off the shelf, you know, Intel server, one new servers, or half new servers, throwing things together. Um, be able to scale things really easily, you know, having that solution built in for redundant disk storage. That was great, but I, I kind of missed um, one important point about the way MapReduce is done, and, and it was my fault. But whenever I would see an example of you know, how to use MapReduce, there was always something like this. And it shows you know, some incomprehensible smushed together data, data set, and you know, had a map phase, Space. And that they invariably pulled out a very simple single value key. Uh, this site I think is uh, map uh, weather, weather station data. And, and as you can see, yeah, sure enough, it's pulling out you know, a year. Or we pull out you know, the URL that was scraped by Google or whatever the example was. It was always a very simple key. And I'm an enterprise IT guy. I have, I have two guys on my team who just support uh, BI and business reporting. They're doing all sorts of complicated aggregations and complies and whatnot. I'm trying to figure out how are we ever going to place this stuff and we just pick out, you know, the year, the sales rep, you know, one at a time. Um, so I'm kind of mistaken because I went to do the Hadoop group at least, sort of smile. It's like, you know, you tell me you can actually have compound keys with multiple values. Um, so I missed that, but, you know, I, I figured that out. Even worse, though, I was wrong about R. I missed the R vote in 1990 when my, when my boss, who was Mr. Mark, in a previous life, encouraged me to use uh, S or S plus, whatever the current version was. And, and all he explained to me was like, it's what I use and some MIT thing is going to be great. <coughs> when I do C, and S sort of got me through um, undergrad, and I did okay with C because I felt like I was a program, but hey, they're all doing some of that to debate. I did fine shining the Fortran pushing physicists in my life. I figured I could handle this, this guy, you know, who the only one in the department who'd be using S. Uh, sure enough. Like, as about many other things, he was right. And 20 years later, um, R has become, R, which is the open source implementation of the S language, has become my go to tool for anything uh, related to data. It's sort of the Swiss Army knife of data, how they think of it. Um, I discovered it when I had a real, another real enterprise IT job. It had a specific uh, purpose, and that was to automate the analysis of our, um, our, our, our large-scale consumer survey data when I was the chief technology officer at Yankee Group. Um, and I had to look back. So if I, if I came into R about three years ago, 
I joined, I joined the art community about three years ago, and you know, so it wasn't too late. Only half of the packages that exist now have been written since then. So I, I consider myself to be on the ground floor, even having missed the boat for, for, for 20 years. So that's what I thought. This is what I get for still the slides. Okay. Before I go on, the one question I would like to ask does, um, is anyone currently using uh, R and a Duke together? One, two, three, four. Okay, so Revolution Analytics has provided these lovely uh, gifts. Would you like a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> or a t shirt? Lovely t shirt. T shirt? Oh, those screaming monkeys are the coolest <laughs> things ever. Anyone, I can throw the monkeys farther. <laughs> it's a screaming slingshot. Who else? Who else wants something? I shot. One more. Okay, if I missed anybody, I missed someone. Okay. So, as that slide that showed the the exploding number of art packages, uh, may may have hinted, hinted, you, hinted to you that there's only more than one way to do anything. I've already mentioned the fly, the flyer, basically the same thing, but from different, uh, different perspectives. Um, really, the, the key feature in, in Hadoop was the introduction of streaming. So Hadoop's a big Java um, uh, system, falls nicely into the Java uh, ecosystem. Um, but and, and before streaming, you have to write all of your extensions in, in Java, right? So with streaming, it allows you to write your mappers, your producers, your combiners, all that stuff. In, in languages other than Java. You know, in any language that can handle uh, standard in and standard out, right? Text input through standard in and standard out. Well, um, so R can do that, right? But R is also sort of at its heart all about data. So since I already knew R, you know, I thought, I thought of using R. There are people who, who are using other languages, of course, to uh, with, with the streaming to, to very good effect. Strong community uh, using Python. Anyone using Python in, in Hadoop? Okay, you can come up later with your t shirts or whatever. Um, but so, so since R is my, 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 my Swiss Army knife, that's what I was using. So I started, like all of my research, with Google, trying to figure out how are people using R in Hadoop. There's never just one R package to do anything. This is a snapshot as of, looks like I updated in July. It's already out of date. Uh, even the revolution uh, version numbers are out of date, but I, I, have, I have an updated slide later. So of, of the top level packages, um, you know, the ones I take a look at, so Hive probably has the most um, unfortunate name. It doesn't have anything to do with the Hive subproject. Um, it stands for Hadoop Interactive. Uh, that's on the simple repository. Uh, there's Repay, uh, which has a, a lot of people working on it. Um, the project seems to be bouncing around between someone's page, it's on the university, so all the links are broken. But I think that link still works. Uh, at the end of the day, it's on GitHub. Um, Segway, unfortunately, if you guys know C Mastication, uh, JD Long, won't be part of this group. I think today is thinking to be here. Apparently, the IRS caught up to it. He actually had to physically move to Bermuda. Where he's been working for a reinsurance company. Um, but he has a very clever R package called Segway, which uses uh, Amazon's Elastic MapReduce um, for small data problems. He has a lot of Monte Carlo simulations he needs to run for uh, insurance risk estimation. Uh, it um, doesn't have a lot of big data, so he sends like you know, a thousand integers to, uh, to MapReduce and uses them as random numbers uh, scenes. Uh, but a very clever package, it does a lot of uh, Tearing up and, and uh, you know, the marshalling tear down of, of, of node 40. And of course, the, the R to do packages. And, and, and are, are there any more? Of course, I'm sure there are many more. Um, and I apologize, <coughs> I've skipped over the one uh, that, that, that you wrote in this group and maybe people in here who put the packages. Um, but uh, 
the one thing I really like about R is it's not that it's not flexible about uh, consuming uh, data from other systems or connecting to other systems. Uh, I, I use it a lot still for relational databases. I haven't gotten away from that part of my traditional IT roots. So, so I, I work a lot, you know, now that it's on my own dime, mostly with MySQL, not with Oracle so much. Um, but there's ODBC connectors, JDBC uh, connectors, um, in addition to all the different uh, you know, file formats you can get to. So with all these options, you know, you look, you look to someone like me, because I'm a market research analyst, and I'm supposed to track this sort of technology. How do you choose, right? Well, instead of using the dark board or the, the sitting thing on your desk to be the executive decision maker, um, I'm going to try to embarrass Jonathan Seidman, who well, is here until we saw his picture on this slide. Where are you, Jonathan? Can you raise your hand? Where are all the He's right back here. Right here. Right back there. There he is. Um, so, uh, so, so, so Jonathan um, brought a, 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 a shotgun to the dart match and um, wanted to release some code on GitHub to try out uh, a few of those different packages. And um, to be honest, I just sort of had to squint a little bit and look at the code to make my pick. This is how I, honestly, got found R Hadoop and picked R Hadoop as my preferred way to, to, to work. Um, but I think it's worth looking at looking at some of the code. Um, the, the data that Jonathan um, used was the, uh, the on-time database. So every month, the US Department of Transportation releases the, the on-time performance, or lack thereof, for every commercial flight in the country. Uh, this, this database, a slightly cleaned up version, was the subject of an ASA Data Expo contest in 2009, and it's sort of known colloquially now as the airline data set. Um, so I know, I know I specialize in some airline data. Trust me, there are bigger data sets out there for, for airlines. I've, I've, I've used some of them. Um, but, but this is it's, it's a, it's a nice, sizable uh, data set. And it's nice that it's available with clean CSV files uh, from the ASA uh, uh, site. Um, so what Jonathan did is he, he picked up you know, one of these numbers in there. Is, is how long uh, how long each flight was delayed, basically. And there's a lot of identifying information we're actually going to get into it. Um, but, but what Jonathan did is he, he wrote some scripts and used these different uh, R packages to figure out what the average departure delay was uh, by, uh, for, by each airline for each month for these. You know, what what, what, what are people like, like, like what year the day? So the first option is, well, Hadoop streaming just needs standard in, standard out. R knows standard in, standard out. Perl, you can R, whatever. Um, here's how you might do it if you're using nothing but you know, base R. And you see you've got stuff that's in there. For those of you who've never seen R code, this is kind of like what R code looks like. When I look at R code, like, it looks like this, with the standard in and with a lot of looping. It looks like Perl to me. I, I, I do Perl well, I'm going to use R. But you know, pretty standard stuff where you're you're looking through, you're reading, you're reading a line at a time, you're making sure you get some data, you, you're doing some on this, and there's some splits. But you know, so you're, you're stripping it on commons, so you're parsing out the CSV file, and you're picking out a couple of fields, you know, position one, and, you know, position 16, and you're assembling stuff, and you're spitting it out. That was, so that was the map phase. Here's the reduce phase. So remember when you're invoking uh, Hadoop streaming, you give it the script that you want to use for the mapper, the script you want to give it for the, the, the reducer, um, and then it manages everything else. So we have to have a separate file with the reducer. Here's the reducer. Again, a lot of the same code. You have to build a standard in, you have to write a standard out, you have to loop through each line. You have to, somewhere in there, you're actually doing something. Yeah, so the partial delay is as generic, and uh, we actually have to keep track of if you're on a new key and whatnot, um, and it's somewhere deep in the middle, we are coming up with an average. Uh, there you go. Uh, way over on the right, mean delays. You can spit that out at any kind of time. So that's what we might look like without any help. Just move on. Uh, keeps high. This is what the code looks like. Again. You're dealing with standard in and standard out, and doing all the basic, you know, same sort of operations. Read date package, um, 
very similar. Again, we've got uh, and that's some stuff in there. Some PCAs here that's coming out. And there's a few more things that we'll see there's not. But you are able to do our constructor the output. This is the code of John wrote for the first version of RMR, version 1.1. I only specify that because there's been a slight change to the mapreduce function. This code doesn't actually work right now, but uh, uh, it doesn't change the length of it. That's it, naturally. Um, you're specifying the mapper in line in the, in the call to mapreduce. The mapreduce function is the one that sends the job to Hadoop and, and gathers all the results. And you're specifying the reduce um, function that so what's the point of showing you all this code that I didn't explain? Well, this is how I made the choice. I figured less code you have to write. That's probably the package I'm most interested in. I'm not being totally facetious. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, so 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 the question was from another C person. If, it, if if you had to write something like this in C, how would it compare, both from the coding perspective and from the performance perspective? Um, so C is fast. Okay, there's, there's no, no two ways around that. Um, you know, uh, R is an interpretive language to the extent that you use base functions in R. Are you familiar with R? Okay, so you're more than you folks. Okay, um, to the extent that you're using base Base functions in R, a lot of them are compiled code in C or Fortran or whatnot, whatever the package software is, is used. Um, I'd say the code, it's funny, I just gave an R workshop uh, last week and I showed uh, uh, some C code to do a computer root mean square and R code to do a root mean square. And in C, you have to do all the loops, you have to go through your array one by one, and do it so it looks like the code we saw before with loops, but you probably get a little more looping. I'd say, you know, I haven't done that. I would say it's probably comparable to writing the, 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 the naked scripting version. It would sort of look like that. Um, you still have to deal with standard and standard out, so that would be new. Um, but, you know, at that point, you know, would, you, would you gain anything performance wise based on how much faster your adapter and your reduced you know, uh, code is? I don't know. Um, my guess is at that point, the Hadoop, the Hadoop experts in the room would probably know that. I would. You probably have a speed bottleneck in the streaming side, in the Hadoop side, at that point. That's just, that's just my guess. Does anyone have any sort of more informed opinion on that? That's a pretty accurate statement. That is an accurate statement. I appreciate that. If anyone disagrees, you can keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, come talk to me. Or you can do it now. Um, so I'm only being half facetious that the shorter is better. I think the R Hadoop, particularly the RMR package, has, has other advantages. It's a really nicely designed API. Uh, you really, as an R developer, as an R programmer, you only have to deal with things that are familiar to you. Basic R data types and objects and lists and vectors and data frames, stuff that, that everyone knows if, if, if you know R. Uh, 1.2, they added a very nice, flexible uh, IO subsystem handle CSV files out of the box, or you can write your own uh, parsing function, which we'll actually do tonight, um, and, and, and it'll wrap it for you. Uh, it wasn't the fastest uh, new feature, unfortunately, but it's a lot faster in version 1.3 because um, you can dash up you know, a thousand lines at a time and send your mapper on it sort of on mass. And you never have to deal with the standard in standard out. You're saved with that whole loop. The R the RMR framework is doing it for you, just as the Hadoop framework is doing a lot of other magic stuff in the background for you. So it is very much a uh, very nice uh, system to, to develop in. And something else that's kind of nice that we're not really going to demonstrate, but I want to mention it here. We can actually call the map reduce function. There are a lot of things you can specify. One of the things you can specify you have to specify the input path, where the data is on the HDFS. You don't have to specify the output. If you don't, it'll make some temporary location for you on the HDFS. But whether you specify it or not, the MapReduce function itself will return that output path specification. 
You know, so you can actually daisy chain calls to the MapReduce function in RMR to have multiple stage uh, jobs. This is a very nice you know, syntactical way uh, to, to, to handle that. Okay, so let's dive into a, a quick overview of, of Varkadu, which is um, some parent project uh, of the RMR library before we get into sort of actually what's some real code line by line looks like. So one of the things I like about the R uh, package is it's modular. Um, there are, it's made up of three packages. It, it bundles the group uh, you know, similar functions, so you only need to learn uh, and you only need to load. You only need to get the prerequisites right and install the parts for your uh, Of course, it's open source, and we all know the advantages of that. Um, the transparency is, is key. It's all on GitHub. If there's an issues tracker, all the stuff you expect on GitHub is there. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an active and growingly active uh, you know, um, contributing code and, and especially finding followers and helping fix them. And the tutorial on how to use R is getting better every day. Um, I was just looking at it last night in preparation for this talk. And you know, it, it, it started out pretty simple, as you might expect, but there are coding, real coding examples on the tutorial now, how to do clean clustering, um, just a progression other stuff right on the tutorial on GitHub. And of course, Archiduke is, is supported. Um, so it's sponsored by Revolution Analytics. And, and as a result, there are training and professional services available. So it's the ring of the room. Is training available? Yes, training is available. How do I know that? Well, I actually wrote the training for Revolution. Uh, it's logical, so it's awesome. <laughs> Talk to your local sales and sales guy. Oh, there he is. <laughs> so I mentioned uh, Arduino is modular, and it, it comes up with three, three, three packages. Um, a package just for HBase. There's a package for um, uh, in interacting with uh, HDFS, and a package that does basically all that MapReduce stuff, R and R. That's the package we're talking about tonight. So it's important to know that the you know, is there. And we each have you know slightly different prerequisites, but as a core, you need you need R. Cloud area distribution is, is recommended, but there's a big long link there to GitHub to show you if you if you roll your own uh, Hadoop, exactly what versions are supported. I think as of the latest version, um, you can use a one point something Hadoop. Uh, you know, CDH3 was 0.92 or whatever. Um, uh, you, can, so you, can, you can use a, a, a current Hadoop. This can't use uh, MR2. One thing on the HBase, it runs through the Thrift server, the Thrift interface, and there seems to be some functionality still missing on the filtering side um, uh, of the Thrift interface for HBase, but this is a little syncs up on those more advanced features will be coming to the uh, to the interface too. I'll pause while everybody who really writes all this down. No, I won't. Uh, bottom line is all the GitHub. Relates to it from, from my GitHub. So, diving into the RMR package itself. There are more functions being added every day, but these are not a part of it. Hello. So, uh, just so everybody knows that we will get the presentation up on the Meetup site for everybody. Yes. So, the if you're if you're site. eagerly eagerly jotting down notes from it, we'll get the presentation up on the Chug Meetup. As well as the yeah, so we'll and the and the video will go on the Vimeo. And the video, we're going to video. So hello, everyone. Okay, so the, the, main, the main functions um, that we'll be dealing with most often are, are these. Uh, there's a convenience function called keyval, which just constructs a keyval object. So you can construct sort of arbitrarily complicated um, keys and values and functions all together. It's the input, the output of every other function online. So we have to worry about the list data frame, just make a key valve, and everything's taken care of for you. Um, there are some basic input-output functions in RMR. It doesn't try to do all the things that the R HDFS function does, where you can do more administrative stuff, like creating folders and create directories and delete directories, and, and, and moving files back and forth, copying files and whatnot. But it has some, has some basics, so it'll get data to 
to the HDFS to pinch, but really it's used to get data from usually the results from uh, the HDFS. Um, of course, in, in 1.2, the big dot, dot, dot format function uh, is the one that at the end is parsing all sorts of different files automatically, file types, or will wrap in our own function as we're actually going to do that. And then really, the, the heart of the package is the MapReduce function itself. So it does the job, you set all the options you ever, ever might want to in, in MapReduce, and as I mentioned, you get a path to the results um, if, if the job is successful. So let's take a look at a really simple example. Again, this is right out of the tutorial on the R uh, GitHub, and it's about as simple as you get. The real R code will really run and are you need to load the libraries you use, are the library you're loading. There are some prerequisites that you saw to load those two for you. Um, this is how you make a, a vector of integers, vectors like an array um, in other languages. Uh, so this one is contained in a thousand integers from one to a thousand, one to a thousand, one to a And since we're having a really small data set, it's safe to use the two.dfs function to write that object to the dfs. Nope, we didn't tell it where to write it, so we'll just make it someplace, probably in slash temp, which is TMD, uh, or DSDR, slash TMD, uh, on, on your HDFS, or however you have it, you're going to cluster uh, configure. 2.dfs will return that path, so we just assign that to the small path variable. And then, um, it's very simple mapping function. Now that we have all the integers on 1 to 1,000, Let's just square them. Okay. This is something we can do in Mapper. Right? We don't need to do it in Mapper. So we'll just, we'll just specify a Mapper, and then we we'll use the default uh, the identity reducer to do the square collect the results. Um, this is how you specify a function in R. So it gets a key, it gets a value, and all we're doing is we're returning, as we say return, because it will go to slide this works too. Uh, it, it constructs a key out there using the value. So using the integer, and then um, the value is the square of the integer. You know, we'll get that. MapReduce function will just go and do it. And as I mentioned, it will return the output path on the HDFS. So the last thing we do is we fetch from the DFS um, the output, assuming it all worked, and convert it to a data frame. Otherwise, it comes back as a list. And no R, no lists are usually one level of indirection beyond what you want, at least that's my example. This is actually what it looks like. This is sort of, I promise, to what was all the with the slide was going before. This is the most mind-numbing slide uh, in the talk, I promise. But it shows you, yeah, it's an honest to goodness you know, Hadoop process. Should look familiar to those folks who are using Hadoop. Um, that's the same command line on one line that appeared on the previous slide. And this one, Looks like I ran this, yep, so I ran this on an EC2 cluster on, uh, on Amazon. <coughs> it took about as long as you'd expect it to, um, in a few seconds. Probably had too many notes for this example. So there's some overhead. And sure enough, at the very bottom, you get uh, your data frame out that has two columns, um, integer input and numeric output, and this is where of course other things, the loads, whatever. Um, 3, 1, 4, 9, all the way up. But even with this simple example, we saw a nice skeleton of what all of your NAPRODUCE functions will look like if you're using R model. You can process your raw input. We didn't have to do this part because we just stuck an, in uh, an integer vector of 1 to 1,000 on the, on the HDFS. Since we used the RMR package to do it, it was in the native RMR format, so there wasn't even any uh, part. And what am I doing here? <coughs> We didn't write a mapper function. We didn't write a reducer function. Uh, and then we submitted the job for execution and got the results from the front This is sort of the way this works. So, I'm going to pause here before we go on. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, one quick question. Um, with respect to the code that you have, very simple, looks nice, easy, and lightweight. <clears throat> is there a kind of a backdoor detail to which Hadoop cluster you're running this on? Is it reading the local Hadoop configuration? Yeah, that's right. So that's a great question. It's like, so what did you really do to make this run? 
let's, let's put this behind the curtain little wizard. Um, and, and, and actually, it was it really parts back to um, the prerequisite. So whatever environment variables I had set up, whatever the do cluster my laptop was pointing to at the time I ran it, that's what that's what got picked up and that's what, that's what ran. It ran on EC2 because I set up a, a cluster on EC2 using Apache Word. Um, I had a config file pointing to it. You know, DFS was pointing to it. Um, so that's where it ran. Clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Excellent. C can you override the default configuration that you have on your machine? Pardon? Can okay. you can you override the default configuration that you have on your machine? Oh, so can you override the default configuration you have? Yeah. yeah so whatever. Um, so RMR doesn't control any of that, right? So just as if you know, RMR was using the same. Uh, was using whatever configuration was set up on, 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 your, on your machine. So if you, um, you know, change the configuration or point it to a different cluster, you know, in theory, if everything worked right, whatever tools, whatever cluster will get hit if you ran the Hadoop command line tool, RMR will hit too, because it's using the same environment variables. And there are people in this room who know a lot more about configuring Hadoop clusters than I do. I just feel like maybe I'm just re-questioning that. I, I feel like maybe what he meant was from the R code, can you override those defaults that you have set to be? Oh, great question. Sorry. Is that, was that a question? So can you override? Yeah. So there is an optional flag to MapReduce, which I've actually been going back and forth on email this week with Antonio, the author of, of RMR. Um, there, is a, there is a parameter in the MapReduce function to override uh, well anything. It allows you to put extra parameters on the on the command line call to reduce streaming, basically. So from, from within your R script? From within your R script. So when you're calling the MapReduce function, there's a backend.parameters parameter or argument that you can specify the number of reducers to use or heap sizes or whatever it is you can do, like minus D when you call calling jobs that you run um, reduce streaming. Yes, sir. Do you have to install anything on the data nodes for this to work in any cluster? Oh, yeah, I probably should have mentioned that. Great question. Do you need to install anything on the data nodes for this to work? And yeah, you actually have to install all of it for it to work. So you have to have R running on the worker nodes. Oh, not the data nodes, but on the worker nodes. If you have something. But yeah, yeah. Wherever the jobs are running, you have to have R. You have to have all the packages you're using, including R bar as a Which is why when I first gave this talk, I spent an hour showing people how to do that. Um, it turns out to be something you Five minutes once you know how to do it. Any other questions? Sure. Um, you talked about uh, plugging algorithms. Uh, um, I'm using Mahu for some, some of that stuff. So, did you, what is there any benchmarks in that uh, with uh, doing clustering or any classification, any sort of machine learning algorithms using R as opposed to as opposed to Mahu? So, so the question, if I heard it quite right, so you're know, so using the hoop to do a lot of um, you know, clustering and, and all the stuff that the does machine learning and whatnot, and are there, are there equivalent packages in R to, to do that? The answer is yes. I haven't used them, so I'm not going to speak to them, but people in the R user group might. Like uh, the question, no, the question is, can you do a simpler? Can you involve my food, my previous jobs? No. R. no, the question was, yeah, I know there were, there are packages in R to do machine learning algorithms. Is there any benchmarking done? Um, benchmarking. Yes, benchmarking done um, as running algorithms using R on you as opposed to Mahu. I, I, I don't know. I mean, they're heavy. Um, sounds like a job for Google. Yes, sir. Yeah. Forgive my naivete here, but uh, doesn't this printout show that uh, we have a, a loop for storing and retrieving a thousand numbers and squaring them run for 14 seconds? <laughs> and, and how does that, I mean, well, so, what so, does that tell So you can even point it out, there's about 14 seconds to square a thousand numbers, which is true, which is true. And there was, um, 
So I probably used a bigger cluster than I should have. Well, first of all, who's using Hadoop for this kind of stuff anyway? Right? <laughs> so there's, there's that. Um, and this is really this is sort of the installation test to make sure all your notes are talking and it sort of works. Um, is this the way you square a thousand numbers? No. Because if you think about you know, what is Hadoop doing in the background, there's a lot of back and forth between the nodes. It's doing the whole, you know, reducing and sorting things by keys. It's making a thousand splits because you have a thousand numbers. And it's just it's a lot of overhead. So, so if we ran it for, let's say, for a million numbers, then we would see a definite advantage. No, no. keep going. No, okay. so I don't think you've seen any advantage for a million numbers either. <laughs> 10 trillion, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Now you start talking about real numbers? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you have an I.O. bottleneck here. And if you're doing a problem that you can easily fit in memory. Uh, the moment you blow the memory, you have the advantage. There you go. The moment you blow through your local memory, you have the advantage. Squaring integers in real life, you're never going to get there. Yes, sir. So when you use R chain, when we use the intermediate data, which internally represents it as some R object, read to draw a different word. What is the realization mechanism behind this writing the R object? So what's the serialization mechanism um, involved when you're writing these objects from, from R into uh, HDFS? What's, what's nice about um, the way RMR does it is it's your choice. So RMR comes with some native serialization, um, which has all the nice R metadata, and which is what made you know, this example so easy, such that we didn't even need to specify uh, an input or an output format, right? Or you can specify raw ASCII, raw binary, I love abbreviation. I love Jonathan's example. Let's go back to the same old data set that we had before. And as it took me you know, much longer than I would like to admit to realize, uh, you can use compound keys. You can fill up more than one value at a time. So we'll do a real example where we do, we do just that. Uh, <coughs> looking at uh, how long it takes to go between uh, given airports uh, over, over time. To review, this is what the data might look like for a given day, my birthday, in 2004. Uh, between Boston and Miami, you see you have traffic going both directions. Boston, Miami, Miami, Boston. You have all sorts of information in there, like airlines, you have tail numbers. This is where things get fun. Um, and you know, somewhere in the end, you have 215, somewhere in the middle there, 215, 215, 197. Those are the times. First thing we need to do from our from our recipe was figuring out how to parse the, um, the data. Now, as I mentioned, RMR in the 1.2 version comes with very flexible uh, uh, code to do this. It handles uh, CSV uh, files really nicely. Um, its speed wasn't so great. It wasn't nearly as fast as the parsing code that Jonathan uh, had written. Um, so I just wrapped Jonathan's code using, um, using the function that, that RMR provides. It basically lets use any parsing function you write to, to do it. And, and since the data is so nice and clean, all it's doing is splitting the line on commas. Uh, may not be safe for all CSV files. Works fine for these nice clean uh, files, especially the ASA versions. Um, and I take you know one other nice idea here. Uh, most of the code you see there 
is setting names for each column. So um, values in R, uh, most of the most of the, the data types in R allow you to assign names to. So as in, so if you're familiar with Perl, you can have an array, uh, use a hash, where you can specify array elements by name in addition to each your index. Um, this is going to give us this flexibility here to pick out values by name, not just uh, not just by name. But of course, you know, it's all the code. <laughs> it's just setting the names. And it's inflexible. And if your data, if your data uh, format changes, it'll break. Um, but this is, an, this is an advantage to having this code all in one place. If it breaks, uh, this is the only place I have to change uh, is this function, rather than you know, specifying the stuff in line. So it could be close. Um, the way we're going to run through this, we're going to show the code first. To show you the data the code gets and the data the code emits. Um, it's going to get pretty much in there. So, you know, what does the MapReduce function, you know, how does it evoke the data for the input formatter? Uh, by default, it's line by line. It's a brand new version of AutoMonitor, version 1.3, that allows you to do, um, by default, a thousand lines at a time for speed, but for, the idea is the same. So for simplicity, we'll just do this, you know, one line at a time. So what are you getting? You're getting one line. It's kind of graphically key value structure, just like everything else um, in our bar. But, but this is what it looks like, and what you're doing, again, you're just splitting it by, by, by the commas, and you're emitting um, a null key, and each field has a value, and they're named. So I remove the name here, or these slides get you know, twice as long and just have the same old names over and over again. Um, you'll see, you'll see that the names really help you out when it's time to write a mapper code. Okay? So um, I didn't expect you to look at, you can look at you know, after the talk, um, how you're how you're picking up the year and the, the departure delay in, in the code before. But here you can see this is where setting the name really, really pays off. So this is this is the mapper function. It's a key and a value. Um, it does some checking up front to make sure that uh, A, you're not getting the header file because we didn't exclude the header file on our input. So if you had a header file that's not the data, you'll get it and you deal with it somewhere. I'm dealing with it here at Mapper. Um, and it's nice to be able to refer to the value array, the value vector in R by name. So if the year element of value contains the word year, Surprise, we've got a header. Um, and also, we want to make sure that nothing really weird happened in the flight, that it wasn't canceled outright, <laughs> canceled outright or diverted to another airport. So, we make sure that the value of those fields equals zero. Secondly, remember, the mapper is where you're picking out things that are unusual on your data. I've made the call that I don't really care if you're flying between Boston and Miami, or Miami and Boston. I'm looking to see how long it gets. It takes to get between these airports for the purpose of this analysis. So I come up with a new variable that I'm going to use for my key, or part of my key, and that's the market. I pick whatever airport comes starts first alphabetically, and whichever one comes second, and I construct that here, market, just by using the paste function. So it's either you know, origin destination or destination origin based on which one is less than and this is a typical alphabetical sort in R. Then I construct the output key by combining, by making a vector of a year and that new market variable. Similarly, I uh, concatenate the combine using the combine function there to see um, the value for the. And this is a nice insight into the airline industry. If anyone, since we're here in the Boeing building, we now call Boeing building. CRS, anyone know what CRS stands for? An elapsed time there? Yeah, so that's the computerized reservation system. 2012 guys, and we're still referring to the computerized reservation system. I actually said this in front of a client last week, and my business partner said, no, 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 it's the centralized reservation system. <laughs> it's like, it's actually, to, as opposed to like uh, the Gambadeus or um, Sabre, a global distribution system. But that, we looked it up on Wikipedia to settle this part of it, and it is actually a computerized reservation system. They've renamed it since then, but they had to use the same uh, acronym or you know, all the code information, right? <laughs> Welcome to aviation, guys. So uh, the open value is just picking the three times the, uh, the elapsed time uh, that the computer thinks the, the flight's going to take, the actual uh, elapsed time, this is uh, gate-to-gate times, and 
and then the, the last time is how much of that time was spent in the end. Finally, the function just returns uh, the key value of pair this value of data, and it's the output key and the output value. Reviewing what does the mapper get? The mapper gets what the input uh, formatter gave it. So the key was null, and the value uh, was just a vector of all the fields named uh, from that line of, uh, of the data. What did we emit in the mapper? We emitted a key value um, pair. The key is a compound of the year of the market, and the value was those, those three times. So then all this magic happens. For those of you who are new to Hadoop, like, like I was when I first started doing this, um, you sort of start to scratch your head. It's like, well, so, so now what? And, you know, if, if you're new to Hadoop, the key is you as the analyst to find what the identifying information uh, is for, for your analysis. And we picked that we're only interested in the airport pair, the market, and the year. So Hadoop listens to you and does all the shuffling and sorting and figuring out, you know, once, once all the data is mapped, how do you get all of the Boston Miami flights for 2004 together on the same node so the right producer can deal with it all on mass? And that is the that is the miracle that the Hadoop folks you know understand a lot better than I do um, how it actually works uh, under the covers, um, but but it does work. Yes, so at that point. So, so the question is, at that point, uh, whatever format the um, uh, R has the data in, it needs to, needs to be converted so we do um, get figure out how to do the, the shuffle and right. sort. And it sounds right to me. I've never really thought about it though. Okay, so that's where the serialization is going to matter a lot, right? That's where if I'm using some, some custom data structure or something like that, I'm going to make sure that it needs to somehow be, be more sortable, it needs to be comparable. Is that right? Yeah. That's, uh, that's a good point that I've never really thought about. Um, you know, does, does the custom serialization that RMR use uh, slow, slow to any of the comparisons out there? Is the comparison I mean, done by RMR or is it done by Hadoop? The comparison must be done by Hadoop, right? Yeah. So uh, RMR must make it easy for it, but I'm going to ask that on the topic. Yeah, that's a good question. Antonio, the author of RMR, does what he's a lot better than I like, so I bet you he didn't uh, make it uh, hard on the way to go along. Yeah? Yeah. Is that a problem if you have secondary keys in your keyword, you sort them and you don't actually use the split? Does RMR let you have secondary uh, components of your key that aren't used in the split? So you, you sort, the, the producer will get them in the sort order, but it won't, it won't break them up between your so it'll sort it, put it off. It'll sort by the. Like imagine it's everything from the same market went to the same producer, but it came to the producer sorted by the year. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, cool. So now it's time to compute some averages. So we're going to write our, our producer. Uh, all, the, all the beginning lines here is because I don't want to learn how to use base R or apply function, though you can see I did. Um, I want to show off that converting uh, lists, the bundled up lists to data frames really easy with a planner package with one line. Um, but, but basically, the, the key is you're getting, and I'll show you what you're getting, uh, each instance of your reducer, each call of your reducer is getting a key. Right? So, same example here, 2004, Boston, Miami. And then you get a list of your vectors. So remember, our mapper was emitting the three times, the schedule, the actual, the air time. Um, so that's what we get, we get a list of those vectors. This is sort of what it looks like you dump it out uh, in R. So it comes to 250, 250, 197 the first line. That, that data file, it's still there. And there, in all of the other subsequent lines from all the other nodes, shuffled, sorted, and stuck on um, the same node and given to the same instance of the producer. Um, so that's 
So all we need to do, uh, all we're actually doing, um, we're using the same key, so we're constructing at the bottom there, the output key is the same key that we got. So this function has key and it has filed on this. So we're constructing a vector for output um, that has the number of elements in our input uh, data. That's what we can compute a weighted average later. Uh, and then um, it does use the average of the actual uh, schedule and the airtime builds up time. And as you can see, R, R knows more statistics than I do. Uh, it even knows how to handle um, missing data, uh, R and with NAs, uh, and the mean function and most of the base statistics functions. And if it gets a data sequence with NAs, it will part and give an NA, because you don't really know what you're talking about. Um, you can tell it to ignore the NAs before you do the, whatever, whatever computation you're doing. And just as before in the map, we return the key valve, that output key, the output value, and, and, and we're done. So we saw what we're getting in. This is what we expect to be getting out. The key has the year in the market again. We've got 12 samples, uh, 12 flights for, for this uh, you know, sample input, and those are the means that they come out. Putting it all together, map reduce function. You don't have to do it this way. This is the way the tutorial suggested, and I like doing this, writing on your own wrapper around MapReduce. It's really handy when you're doing complex workflows and you want to do the daisy chaining, and you can give it sort of nice names. So it's a, little bit, it's a lot of typing, but I'm kind of a pedantic programmer types. Um, so it's MR, it's a MapReduce uh, function, um, key on year and market to compute the 100 times. Takes the same input and output, which are the HTML paths that MapReduce needs, and then I specify all the things we did before. So we wrote that ASA CSV text input format formatter. That's the first thing we did. We just specify that and we're calling MapReduce. Input format equals the name of the function. Um, what well, mapper function, mapper.year.market.omnu time, that's the mapper we wrote. We specify that as the map parameter. Similarly for MapReduce, um, there was a question before, can you override the defaults? Uh, yes, you can, and here's where you do it. With the backend dot parameters uh, function, you can give it all sorts of options there. Um, and you see, if you're into the Java command lines, you see that it's D equals mapred dot reduce dot tasks equals 10. Um, you know, I, I learned this the hard way, as I'm sure many of you have, by default, no matter how big your cluster is, if you don't fill with the config files you get, one and only one reduced task uh, gets crushed by all of the data from all your mappers uh, after the shuffle. So here you specify, I think I had 10 nodes running, so I specified 10 reduced tasks. Uh, and then we have some um, you know, housekeeping setting an output path, which, as I mentioned before, is, is not necessary, especially if it's an intermediate step, but I actually want to know where the stuff is going, so I, I specify my own. And then I just call it, and uh, I got my results path um, in, in results. Just should call the results path. Uh, you know, all the stuff you saw before, but actually doing you know, real data on a real cluster, coming up with some new results, and grab the data frame uh, from the .dfs using that results path, convert it to, to a data frame. I told you why I like to do that. Make sure the column names are what I wanted, and then. Um, so this can be embarrassing, especially when you're using a sort of transient cloud-based cluster. Don't lose the data, okay? You've just done a little 47,000 things. Don't lose the data. Uh, R has a really nice uh, way of compressing and, and storing data in its own format. It's a safe function. And that's all that the last, um, the last bit of code there does. What comes out if you do this with the entire um, you know, data set is 42,612 lines of code, uh, sorry, of, of, of results. Um, it sounds like a lot, but it's easily, you know, to your point, when would you use Hadoop for something like that? You wouldn't use Hadoop to crunch 42,000 numbers either, just like you wouldn't use it to crunch thousand <coughs> integers. So, you know, showing off some R, this is how you, this is how you could use the wire package to aggregate, you know, these results, and so do it by, um, So I guess we're just doing this by, by year, right? So, so, so stripping out the, 
the, the, the airport part. Um, and I guess the, the, the punchline for this, for this slide is, yes, it seems the US airports uh, are getting farther and farther apart as, as, the, year, as the years go on. Uh, so we went through a lot of and so it was glossed over and some of it was uh, some of it was not the most exciting code. Um, that's all up here on the GitHub. You know, as we mentioned, all the slides will be available so you can actually start playing around with stuff. Um, before we end, I wanted to show, up, show you a couple of things, especially uh, the first one is of special interest for those who may be newbies to, to the new space. And that's a wonderful feature that Armour comes with. It's a local backend. So you don't even need a Hadoop cluster of any size, one node or otherwise, um, though it's always fun to see all the status messages come up. You can set um, a local uh, backend option to Armour if you call anything else in Armour, and Armour will simulate a Hadoop cluster. It doesn't do all the nice status messages that, that you see all the, the all the percent stuff that that would induce uh, uh, status, but it's really handy if you're just trying this stuff out, or even if you're just if you're really into it, uh, anyway, just development and, and testing. So you have it kind of running um, on, on your local chain without the complexities of, uh, of Hadoop. It's, you know, how it is in my scenario down uh, the moving parts of the thing, something that you can And then, um, really can't end without mentioning the other uh, R2 packages. I'm going to talk about the main with this. Uh, we're going to say that they're there. Um, and these are the sort of functions that those other packages give. We've talked a lot about the RMR packages. If you're in the HBase, um, you know, with the exception of the limitation on um, coming up with arbitrary, sorry, the limitation of coming up with arbitrary filters uh, when you're scanning um, all, all sort of basics, uh, interactions you expect. Through the HBase are available from the RH based package. And similarly, um, if you do want to script your data management on the HDFS from R, for whatever reason you did, you know, directory is and moving files around and um, all that kind of stuff, setting permissions and whatnot, you can do all that in the HDFS. So um, thank you very much. That's all I got from you. Hopefully, I can Quick introduction to you know how to use R to do at least one way. Right. So I'm here for any questions or discussion. And you know, thanks, thank you to all of you for your time and attention, and thanks for the revolution for uh, bringing me out here. So, thank you.